Welcome back to DWeb Decoded, your guide to navigating the decentralized web. I'm your host, Aaron Stanley, and today I'm talking to Vinny Lingham, who's a serial entrepreneur, Web3 personality, and a longtime supporter of the Filecoin IPFS ecosystem. We talked about the early days of Protocol Labs, why Filecoin's value proposition is stronger than ever, and the opportunities and challenges ahead. Let's get started. Uh, Vinny, it's really great to have you on the show. Aaron, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Amazing. Well, to get started, uh, why don't you just give us a quick introduction to yourself and your professional background, how you got into crypto, Web3, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so I've been a serial entrepreneur pretty much my whole life. I started my first company when I was in college, <laughs> university. So um, yeah, just building, building different things. And eventually, uh, I was studying tech, studying you know, programming, and um, I, just want to, I always wanted to be in the tech world. So that's where I, I started off. I started working actually in, from South Africa, so I started working in Johannesburg, doing um, online marketing back in the early days, 2002, 2003. I started my first company, which was a search engine platform, um, you know, kind of connecting to Google and all the search engines and, you know, feeding in ads, that sort of thing. So in the ad tech space, Um, I spent a lot of time in the U.S. I was probably, uh, you know, four or five months a year back and forth on business. I just loved living out here and being out here. So I eventually moved from from Cape Town to... um, Northern California, San Francisco Bay Area, and spent about a decade there. And now I moved down to Southern California about six years ago. So I've been in the state 16 years. Um, and I've uh, started, I don't know, close to, close to about 10 companies now. Um, and, uh, you know, but as founder CEO, I think I'm at like six. Um, and I'm kind of currently running Rumi.ai, which is a video conferencing platform. Um, it's, you know, kind of like Zoom. And uh, some of the smart note-taking apps, but all rolled into one uh, platform. So there's a lot of things we can do, which is uh, different. And we've been doing, you know, AI in a, a able video conferencing longer than Zoom, <laughs> so that's cool. Um, but you know, I've had I had some pretty decent successes in my career. My my first company was sold recently to the Carlyle Group, one of the biggest private equity groups in the world. Um, after 20 years, actually, uh, since I started wow. that company, and so it's still that's going. Impressive. Yeah, it's still going strong. Thousand employees. Um, Billions of dollars in billables and stuff as a as a ad tech platform, um, but you know it's great. Um, people I hired are still there. <laughs> my <laughs> CEO at the exit was my VP of sales that I hired, so you know it was a good journey for the team. Um, but you know I left there. I left there when I went, when I moved to the states, um, and uh, I you know one of the companies I started along the way was a company called Gift, uh, GYFT, mobile gift card platform, and started that in 2012. And built it up to quite a significant size business um, by the time we exited and by the time I left. But one of those like weird moments for us was trying to monetize and getting people to use the, the platform. And um, we had a lot of credit card fraud back in those days. This is 2012, 2013. And what we rec- recognized was that Bitcoin had um, you know, uh, you know irreversible payments. So with a credit card, you get a chargeback. And... The merchant can lose. So if, if you use a stolen credit card to buy a gift card from us and you charge back afterwards, we, we lose that sale and we've lost the code for the gift card. So we moved on to Bitcoin uh, early on and it was mind blowing how much, you know, how much, uh, like how different it was, uh, the benefits of using it for, for users, consumers. And we became the biggest, I think we were the biggest Bitcoin website in 2013 or 14 worldwide. And at one stage, in a couple of days, we did five percent of all Bitcoin transactions in the entire world. <laughs> like, oh, you're com- up there, up there with Silk Road, right? At that point, yeah. Right? <laughs> oh, yeah, but it was. But, but, you know, the funny thing is, it, it was pretty high. But it was like around Christmas time, right? People are buying gifts and stuff. So there was oh, yeah. gift card and so between you know Black Friday and around Christmas time, our sales would go through the roof. Um, and this is back in the days before you had exchanges. So that's how I got into crypto. Um, Things took off. Uh, Gift grew into um, you know a, a great business. We got acquired by uh, First Data Corporation, which is now Fiserv, largest payments company in the world. They do trillions a year, and uh, I got my first big exit uh, in 2014. Um, and about that time, I was looking around for cool stuff to invest in. And obviously, I was investing in Bitcoin. And Bitcoin was the only kind of game in town in crypto back then. Uh, there were a whole bunch of these other, you know, Namecoin and Feathercoin and <laughs> Litecoin and whatever else. Um, you know, but there was nothing else that was too interesting. But I actually had set an alert on, you know, the, I think the word Bitcoin or crypto or whatever it was. It wasn't crypto back then. It was, it was blockchain or Bitcoin, I think. Um, and... 
I, I found this uh, pitch that was going happening at, at Y Combinator from a, a young guy named uh, Juan Benet. <laughs> you know, and uh, it was I thought it was interesting because he called it Filecoin at the time. So anyway, I emailed him and I said, "Hey, are you raising money? Can I you know, can I can we chat?" And he sent me his white paper, and I kind of read through it. The, the, the math was way above my math grade, but I, I kind of got the gist of what he was trying to build. Uh, hopped on a call for him, uh, with him, and I uh, spoke to him, and you know, I liked him. It was great, like you know, local Palo Alto guy. I was living in Palo Alto at the time, and uh, so I cut him. I think I, I think I cut him his first check. I was the first investor in in Protocol Labs, um, and th- that was at the point he was trying to figure out, you know, IPFS and and and, and Falcon was. So, you know, something a little further out um, as we as we you know we look back we see it now, but that was the start of a, a great you know friendship and investment as well and um, being part of the ecosystem is just helping um, Juan you know think through things and uh, we met for breakfast a couple of times at Life Kitchen <laughs> out in Palo Alto and spoke about all the stuff we're doing at IPFS level and he educated me so much on what's going on. And what he was trying to build, and the vision was huge, right? So it's a really big vision. Um, the you know the, the simplified version of it was okay. You're trying to build something which is going to replace HTTP with a uh, you know with content referencing as opposed to server referencing, and this is a cool idea because when you came from South Africa, you realized that you know the the amount of data that you had to pull from servers you know halfway around the world was ridiculous, and mm. if someone was hosting the data locally, and you could you know reference a piece of content as opposed to uh, you know, reference a file locally nearest to you versus jumping 25 hops to get a file, you can speed things up considerably. And then, um, you know, that, that got me in. So uh, at that point, I, I invested. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, then 2017 came around. And, uh, you know, uh, he was looking at you know, ICOs are a big thing. And I did, I did an ICO for Civic back in 2017, one of the first ones. That was my next company after Gift. And we're still around building you know, identity infrastructure um, for, you know, call it Web3, Web2, whatever, but it's it's blockchain-based in terms of the way we run the security on that. And, um, you know, we're still we're still going. And so we want, we're one of the first ones. I think we, we got out in June of 2017, and Filecoin was done in August, I think. Uh, yeah, it was like August or September of that year, from that mistake. So we were we were on the conference circuits together, speaking about things. You and I were discussing how you know how things would look. We, you know, it was back in those days. So, um, yeah, we I, I guess we go back way back. And and I've been a huge fan of Filecoin. Um, it, you know, obviously part of protocol. Um, you know, and I participated in, in, in the Filecoin ICO. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of the quick background, I guess, on my involvement. Okay. Um, Early on, and uh, and just been a huge uh, huge supporter. Great, great. I, I still remember the Civic beer machine vending machine from yeah. Consensus twenty eighteen. I think I spent like half an hour trying to get my like scan my pic the picture of my my driver's license so I could <laughs> get a free beer out of your vending machine. Uh, but it's We've cool to hear that that's since then. I mean, like it's funny <laughs> talking about that today with my co founder. Actually, um, I mean that was a real great use case. Um, but it's so hard getting adoption, right? Um, yeah. And, 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 and the adoption curve for something like that is really, it's challenging. And I think one of the problems in crypto is finding these use cases that can go mainstream where normal people can use it without having to think about what happens on uh, on, on blockchain or how identity works, et cetera. And, and then, you know, how is this better than what they already have? Like you can go to a bar, and, but now there's a vending machine, but now... You know, the, if it's in a lobby of a hotel, then they have to worry about who's accessing it. Funny thing is, you go to Japan and there's beer vending machines everywhere, and there's no ID required because they have an honor system. We know this does <laughs> work in the U.S. We know this will never work here, <laughs> but it does work in Japan. <laughs> See, Japan has no need for for blockchain solutions like that. Yeah, it's all, like, you know, it's the, the, the honor base is crazy. Yeah. The trust is embedded in society. They don't need a they don't need a trust machine blockchain ledger. They just everyone just trusts each other naturally, I guess. But exactly no no that, that yeah the with the the vending machine. I thought it was such a cool idea, but it was like I, I think the reason it didn't work is because I it the it was placed in kind of like a darker corner of the room, so there wasn't enough light like shining on my my ID to like actually scan I'll come it to properly. Twenty twenty eighteen. It's still so- yeah. Still dealing with the aftermath of 2017, so I think people who had boots all paid for it in 2017. They were all signed up, so that place was a 
It was a mess. <laughs> yeah, it was a bit of a jungle. It was a bit of a jungle. My in my previous life, I used to I used to uh, produce and program the consensus uh, consensus from the editorial side. So that was sort of my uh, yeah. The 2018 year, we had a bit of a reckoning after that because it was it was just like kind of over the top. Um, but um, but anyway, so we kind of we took a little bit of a time travel uh, opportunity with you here back 10 years uh, ago, you know, 2014. Talk a bit about uh, your how you first got introduced to Juan, how you got first introduced to, to Protocol Labs, and, and some of the ideas that Juan was was shopping around at that time. And and you gave us some some good background there. But would love to maybe just dive into um, I don't I don't know like like what was it that you saw in in Juan and like the ideas that he was shopping that, 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 I, I mean, you obviously saw some things that some other people didn't see. Right. Um, and wonder if you kind of just dive into like, what like really stuck out from like, wow, like this guy's really onto something here. And I don't think other people are really appreciating or realizing, uh, sort of the breadth of this vision. You know, when I invest in entrepreneurs, I often like investing second time entrepreneurs with something to prove. Um, and so Juan, he, he just had his he, previous company bought by Yahoo, which is, you know, it was a big deal back then. I was like, wow, you know, well, well done, great exit. And when I spoke to him on the first call, he did not seem happy about it at all. He was kind of like, you know, it, it, it wasn't a big enough exit or he, he, you know, the outcome wasn't good enough for him. And he had a chip on his shoulder. And I love finding people with chips on their shoulders. I love finding brilliant people who are just like, pissed about something, and they're going to go prove the world that they can do it. And so he had this grandiose vision, clearly very bright, um, had some operating experience building building a company, and he had a chip on his shoulder, and that was all I needed to write the check. Um, so on the call, I said, sure, I'm in. Uh, and, he, and he had this, like, level of cockiness and arrogance, but, you know, not, not to the point that it was insulting to me. And he was like, look, you know, this is what I'm doing, and, you know, Kind of, this is a, you know take it or leave it type of thing, and um, I like that about him actually uh, because it's very uh, if people try and be cocky for the sake of being cocky just to like you know put up a bravado and it's fake you can tell but when it's like just the way his brain works um, you, you know you realize that this is a guy who's going to solve the tough problems and be there and figure this out. Um, and he's got the wherewithal to do it. And so that was for me an easy win, easy you know, investment. Um, and I think I doubled down in the next round as well with him. So I, I supported him with a cut through a couple of rounds when he was raising. Um, but that was it. it was a, you know, I, I'm a very much a you know, b- back the person type of guy. Uh, obviously, I need to understand the idea, but it needs to be somebody I think is very backable. Yeah, so he had that had that chip on the shoulder that you're looking for that 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 mm-hmm. that determination that drive, yeah. um, and then I'd love for you to get to, I'd love to get from your perspective. Um, you know, let's talk a bit about the Filecoin value proposition here, um, and or at least maybe like the narrative around what Filecoin's value proposition is. And I would love to get your thoughts on how this has maybe evolved over the years. Uh, maybe starting back in 2017 during the token sale. Um, up until now, or what, probably like six, seven years later, uh, mainnet's live. Uh, we've got like a functioning protocol, functioning ecosystem here. Um, but there seems, does seem still to be some maybe confusion around like what Filecoin actually is. It's kind of like maybe like a Rorschach test in a sense where some people look at it and they think it's, oh, it's Filecoin. It's for storing files, right? Other people look at it and they see like, oh, wow, this is basically like, you know, the infrastructure for a new decentralized internet. Um, and maybe somebody, other people are kind of in between there. Uh, but I would love to get your thoughts on just how you've seen the, the value proposition evolve here, or, or at least what people perceive to be the value proposition. Yeah, I, I think the, the initial proposition was obviously IPFS, which is a censorship resistant uh, content you know, addressing network where you can put files in everywhere and connect it through uh, IPFS. And then you could, you know, it was, for me, that was a that was the starting point. Is something on a global scale that just um, is heavily censorship resistant um, and brings data closer to you know it brings the source closer to the people who need to use it. Uh, it obviously, Filecoin was always the, the sort of next step. How do you create the incentive layer around that? How do you uh, use crypto economics to you know incentivize the creation of a network? I mean. We've got over 10 exabytes of capacity on the Filecoin network right now, and that's pretty huge. I mean, that, that's a massive amount of data storage capacity. Um, but you know, you also had to incentivize miners to go and build that infrastructure out. 
in a, in a decentralized way across the globe. So I think that that's played out. Um, there's been a bunch of other interesting uh, things that have been developed since. Um, I didn't expect FEM to come out. When, I guess when I invested, that wasn't that wasn't a thing, uh, and that evolved, and that looks like it's going to create a very powerful and very decentralized, um, you know, uh, virtual machine service on top of. So you, now you have computer, uh, computer and data can be in the same place. It's very powerful if you think about it. Like right now, if you want to take data and run compute, you have to move the data from one place to another. But with FEM, you can run the compute where the data is. Um, so there's a lot of interesting things you can do there, especially with very, very large data sets. Um, and um, I, I think, you know, Filecoin's obviously been a price slump. Uh, and that's just because the marginal price of Filecoin hit 200 and something bucks back in the early days when there was 15 million out there or 20 million out there. And the inflation just slowly got absorbed by the market over time, and the price came down to, yeah, I think it touched as low as two something in the in the past year, and now it's back up to over seven. Uh, price is not that important, I think. If you, you know, like price and utility are somewhat divorced right now, uh, you can still use a Filecoin network and get all the value out of it without having to worry about what the price is, uh, per se. Um, but I do think it makes a difference in terms of the ability to. Um, get ecosystem participants to benefit from the growth and the network effects. So we have to resolve some of the issues around perception of the network. Um, the one perception is that the F fully diluted value is you know the current market cap times four, which is true. So 500 million plus coins are issued in two billion maximum. Uh, and so you multiply it out, you say, oh, wow, you know, we're seeing a 10 billion plus FTV. The reality is it'll take 20 years to get there. Um, so... You know, not all crypto economic metrics are created equal. Um, they, they look equal, but they're not really. So you have to look at the sort of annual inflation rate. But then you also have to look at the miners. And unfortunately, a lot of the miners and, and service providers in uh, Filecoin are, they, I call them mercenaries. They don't really care about the network. They just provide their services. They, they borrow, they forward sell their Filecoin. They don't really hold it. So the buying support really comes from people who want to use the network and invest in the network, and the miners kind of ob out that um, you know, that excess value over time. Now it will change because very you know at some point people realize that that there is only a limited amount of Filecoin out there at a certain price point, and people are stacking into their portfolios and holding, and they are, you get long term holders like myself, um, you know, and and others who are just you know, adding more Filecoin all the time, and then the inflation rate slows. So there's, there's an equilibrium point. But for the most part, I think um, figuring out the tokenomics in such a way that um, it's comparable to other projects is something we, we have to work harder at within the network because it just confuses a lot of people because we aren't going to have Filecoin go from 500 million coins to 2 billion in two years or three years or even five years like other projects. So the FTV metric matters a lot less. Um, but it is a it is a point of contention because people who have a very cursory view of the network don't understand that they just look at it they go oh, and so we have to resolve that. So I think my, miners giving making miners have more skin in the game and the willingness to be long Filecoin as opposed to uh, Filecoin neutral um, is very important. Um, but other than that, I think overall market market participants you want to own a piece of this network. I'd say you know it, it's a it's, I'd say one of the most important networks in crypto. Yeah, the FTV metric is is interesting, um, and I, I really I mean, I've heard you mention this the same critique in other forums. I think you've posted about it on Twitter a few times as well uh, in the last like year or so. Uh, but was, I remember back when I worked at CoinDesk, and I, I got pitched to do something about Filecoin. I think back in like 2020, right around, around the main net launch, and this, that was the FTV metric was the pitch that was being made to me. I think it was like the outside firm that Protocol Labs was employing the PR firm. They're like, "Oh, look at the FTV of Filecoin; it's X billion dollars," and it was kind of this like eye popping number. Like, "Oh my gosh, that's a huge, that's a huge, massive number." Um, and it, I mean, it, I, I didn't really understand what the significance of that metric was, but it, it definitely caught my attention, right? Uh, mm -hmm. As 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 somebody in the media. Uh, but from what you're saying, you, like the FDV metric is something that is a bit like problematic and maybe maybe not necessarily disingenuous, but it's not necessarily it's maybe one of these metrics that people have kind of focused on because it it's maybe like it, it catches people's eyeballs, but it's not actually like reflective of of the health of the network or or the actual utility of the network. Yeah, if I had to choose a metric to use, 
I would work on a, on a four year a four year inflation average inflation rate. Similar to Bitcoin, right? So you know what the inflation rate is for four years after every halving. So if you look at what is Filecoin's expected inflation over the next four years, and you actually plot it out the curve, it looks something like seven, six percent, seven percent per year over four years. Um, maybe a little bit lower. Who knows? Like five and a half, whatever. But you can compare that to other networks that are sitting at 10, 15 percent, um, but the FTV number is lower because they're going to hit the, the, the terminal number sooner, right? So we have a longer period to go at 7%, and they have a shorter period to go at, at, a, at a higher percentage. It's, you know, how, how do you actually figure out, like, I think if you look at, like, some sort of stock-to-flow ratio, uh, you know, comparing that to Bitcoin and other things, I think, a, you know, a four year is probably a good number. How much inflation do you expect? Because that inflation is new issuance of the network, so that's a dilutionary effect. And you want that number as low as possible. Bitcoin is sitting at like I think before the having now like two percent or something, uh, or some very very low number. So Bitcoin inflation is extremely low. This is why the price is going up because there's only so much new Bitcoin coming on the market. Mm-hmm. Filecoin went from when we launched the network, I think fifteen million coins on the sort of inception date. To six hundred million in five hundred fifty million in four in three years, uh, you know it's just over three years. That's a lot of inflation the markets had to absorb, and that's why the price, you know, the marginal price spiked and then just slowly slid down and crashed. And because the market just couldn't handle it, going from fifteen million units to um, to you know five hundred million units. Um, that said, now it's slowed down. Now it's thirty five million. So if we can increase the burn. If we can increase, um, you know, service provider participation and giving them a reason to hold Filecoin as opposed to selling it, um, and you know, th- th- and that's the other downside here, by the way. So I think miners they don't want to change that system. They like the low risk system. They see themselves as kind of mercenaries. They provide a service. They get paid in dollars, and they just are the Filecoin uh, investor network. Um, you know, investors buy Filecoin, uh, and they are happy to participate in that upside, but they don't want to hold the file coin. So these are the issues that we have to solve. But you know, that's like, I mean, it's solvable, but that's that's the, that's the one part of the equation. The rest of the network is functioning beautifully. I mean, the number of new developers coming on, what they're building, how it's being used, um, the fact that it's cheaper. So Solana just announced that they'll be storing 250 terabytes on Filecoin. Now they couldn't do this on our Reef or any of the other platforms. It's too expensive, and um, and you know we have guarantees on the storage and the capacity and availability, etc. Which I'm not sure the other service providers in other distributed storage systems can offer the same thing for the long term either. So it's it's it's, it's great to see developers saying, "Hey, we need to move on to Filecoin." And this touches another interesting question I, I wanted to, to throw your way um, and wanted to get your 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 take on just given your vantage point. But uh, in the landscape of have decentralized, you know, Web3 storage and compute platforms, how do you reckon that Filecoin is stacking up when, I mean, there's all these other alternatives out there that maybe have, you know, have different kind of marketing approaches or whatever. Maybe they're able to get a bit more publicity or whatnot, but uh, and there's other also like kind of new competitors like, like you know, BNB Greenfield and these types of things popping up. Um, but do you, I mean, how do you kind of frame that? I know I see people on Twitter kind of ask you about this quite a bit and you're, you're always kind of, you know, defending Filecoin, but how, how do you respond to those people that are like, well, what about this project? What about that project? Well, first of all, you, you, you need some sort of, uh, and, and obviously you don't need to, you, you don't need Filecoin to be able to use IPFS, but IPFS is the foundational layer for distributed, um, uh, storage, you know, so Anyone building on top of IPFS is now building, you know, some sort of storage system on top of a, a, a protocol that was developed by, by the Filecoin team, which I just think kind of weird, right? Like you can do it, but sure, I, I'm I'm pretty sure Filecoin will always be ahead um, because the team of Protocol Labs built both protocols, um, and so they they've already thought about the the vision for where this is going. I think uh, I haven't seen any economic model that makes any sense for someone to store data at scale for long periods of time. I've seen a lot of these permanent storage things. Sure, I will do permanent storage for a, for a graphic or an image. That's easy. Like I mean, I can permanently store a, a 50, 50 meg or even a 100 meg file for 100 years and pay for it now. Like the, the math makes sense. When you're doing it at scale, 250 terabytes or 
you know, an exabyte, it doesn't work, right? The, the economics just don't make sense. There's, there's actual physical atoms that need to be in place in a in a hard drive that holds the stuff and then power and maintenance. Like, it doesn't make sense. Um, so when I look at all these services out there, I mean, there's some interesting stuff. Maybe ICP is interesting. Looks a bit over-engineered, but who knows? Um, there's um, obviously there's Arweave, and that probably has its own use case. But, I mean, Filecoin can store like 100 Arweaves on, <laughs> on the network, right? So Arweave is, uh, is small by comparison. Um I just think that to get to scale, and and, and and Protocol raised a lot of capital over the years um, to do this, and to get to this sort of scale and this sort of um, level of and, and, and engineering as well. We've got Protocol's had some of the best engineers in the world working on, on this project for years, and you just can't rep- replicate that easily. So I'm skeptical that we're, we're going to see a competitive Filecoin rise while Filecoin is still you know, building up all these services, and, and, um, and FEM is doing really well right now. So... Um, you know, admittedly, I'm biased, right? Like, I'm you know, <laughs> for the reasons I've said, but I just don't see it coming. And if it does come, I'd be interested in seeing why. Why would it be better? But that is a good point, though. In that, in that, um, you have you have you have kind of IPS and Filecoin being developed by the same core team, and IPS and Filecoin have serving as essentially like two pedals on the same bike. And any potential competitor would need to replicate basically both of these ideas either as separate things or as a single unified thing. Um, so there's, there's obviously like the idea, there's obviously like the, 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 the model that goes into to building that, but then there's also just the time, like these things don't happen overnight, right? The protocol labs has had a, basically a 10 year head start on building this stuff out where if somebody else just shows up and says, Hey, I'm going to build a new decentralized storage thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've got like, they, they're going to have, they, they're going to have to replicate that 10 years worth of work that PL did in, you know, a very short period of time, basically to, uh, to even be competitive essentially. So it, do, it definitely does make sense. Um, and then maybe going back to how, you know, Filecoin or the, just the state of the, the network is, is maybe being perceived right now. Are, are there any other areas, uh, that you see that are maybe like very misunderstood, um, uh, just uh, things about IPFS or things about Filecoin that people like just don't understand that maybe they like you, you would have hoped that they would understand by now. I mean, to be fair, I, I don't understand the full scope of the network. It has become so big, <laughs> so many participants doing so many different things. I don't like the surface area of this network is, uh, is beyond any one person as it stands today. I, I mean, yeah, and, 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 and that's, that's like, that's a good thing. <laughs> I I don't think anyone really understands how big Filecoin has become and, and how it's being used. Any one person, I'm sure teams do, um, but it's being used in a big way. So, And that's a good thing, right? There's, it's a good thing that anyone can sign up with permissionlessly, just start using the network and paying for fill and paying for storage and building applications on FEM and writing contracts. And I mean, Glyph is another company invested in, in the ecosystem. Glyph is crushing it. I mean, they're sitting over $250 million in TVL with $33.6 million fill that's locked right now. Um, that's huge, Okay. They've locked over 5% of the network, and I'm one of the seed investors there. Uh, it's growing really, really quickly. Um, and and the TVL in the Filecoin ecosystem, I think the locked TVL is something like 50, 50 million plus, 50 million plus, and Glyph is the market leader there. Um, you know, there's so much innovation that's happening around this, and that's, um, and so, yeah, and that's just one area. This. Like I said, the surface area for Filecoin is is extremely big. I mean, I, I don't know how many developers are on there right now. Probably 10,000, 50,000, like some big number. Are, are there other areas, you mentioned Glyph just now, but are there other uh, projects or companies in the ecosystem that you have have seeded uh, or that you've been invested in or, or supporting in some other way? Yeah, I'm an early investor in uh, Secured Finance. I don't know if you know those guys. Um, they're based out of, or, I mean, globally, but they're based out of um, Japan. Um, Masa's, I guess he's all over the place. But, um, you know, they started basically building on the Filecoin network. He's been working with Juan for a while on this. Um, uh, and they're trying to effectively bring, um, you know, a capital market solution into in, using Filecoin so you can create, like, you know, zero coupon bond issuances, trading, fixed rate loans, forward loans, um, that, that sort of thing. They're doing some really, really interesting stuff. They're, they've been working on it for years. They've got a great team. Um, 
and it's backed by you know, myself and a bunch of other people. And they just launched it recently, so I think it's it's live. Um, uh, and they they supported, uh, I think it was Axel Phil, um, ETH, WBTC, USCC, and they're just allowing people to lend and borrow. And it's it, look, it's DeFi, right? But now DeFi is coming to to Filecoin, which is fantastic. Um, there's probably a whole bunch of other ones in my portfolio. I'm not no, sorry if I, I can't call them more fan. <laughs> but those are the, those are my those two those two are my my, my um, the secure is one of my bigger investments as well. I like what they're doing. Okay, okay, great, great. Um, and I know you're doing some work with you know in the AI space right now. You've got a new company, uh, you know, the video conferencing uh, kind of uh, Zoom competitor that's, that's incorporating AI. Uh, but we'd love to get your thoughts on you know what do you see as maybe the overlap between the world of AI and then Filecoin. Like, what, what what does the Filecoin have? What, what does the Filecoin network kind of have to offer the world of AI, especially as there's more conversation around, um, you know, decentralizing these AI systems and language models and things of that nature. Like, what what role do you, do you see Filecoin maybe playing here? So, if I asked you to draw fifty pictures today, you, you could probably get done, you know, over a course of twenty four hours as a single human. Um, I, if I said to you, hey, can you draw a thousand? You'd probably struggle. And if I said draw ten thousand, you'd freeze up. He's like, Vinny, I just can't possibly do that. W- with a machine, you could tell it to generate an infinite amount of photo images, graphics, video, audio, uh, you know, video clips, etc. The amount of storage we're going to need for that is beyond belief. AI is going to allow you to write a script and say, hey, go and create a thousand potential videos of you know, Vinny and Aaron playing chess uh, with Richard Branson on Mecca Island. <laughs> okay, And it'll like all these videos, and that's, that's hundreds of gigs. And now we have to go, go through them and see which ones we like, sort through them. But you've got to store this data. It, doesn't, you know, it spits it out. But now, so you can, like, to just using models, right? Uh, the amount of data a machine can create now using generative AI from scratch, things that we want to store, we want to at least house, or you know, you, you could look at, um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm become an amateur pilot, a student pilot, and busy trying to learn how to fly, and I find it very interesting when you look at these crash reports and you look at, uh, you know, uh, NTSB reports. They've got all the they've got all the data, so they've got data now of like this plane took off from this. Uh, airport at this heading landed here, or, 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 or this you know wing broke off, or whatever. Like, right? and then, but you have to watch it in like you actually have to watch it on a on a map, a two kind of a two dimensional map, and you can't really see what happened. You can't really see the altitude. You could build a system right now to just feed in every single all the radar reports of every single major incident or, or crash, or even just every single plane ride. And there's an idea for someone, and you can pull the data in, and you can. You can use AI to generate using, you know, what plane it is, what model it is. You have all the altimeter data, and you can just create this, this, this system where you can go and pick on any flight that happened in history and watch this thing take off, knowing the map, what the ground looks like roughly, the terrain, and watch it in real time. And you could probably write this in such a way that it takes, you know, maybe a few weeks or months of coding, uh, if that, and it generates it. And now it's going to generate, you know, exabytes of data. But using real world data, and it can turn into movies, so you can actually go and watch what happened, and click a button, and and it's already you know it's already been pre generated, and you can watch the entire flight from all the different angles, whatever. Like that's just one example of what you can use AI for. You know, it, 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 it's 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 insane how um, how much data we are going to create as a result of AI over the next couple of years, and I don't think even at ten exabytes, that Filecoin's network's big enough to support that data. Interesting, interesting. So, so you're saying that basically, the amount of data that's going to be created using these with 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 just the emergence of generative AI, the current kind of Web two, you know, cloud storage model, there's just not going to be enough capacity or financial incentive to be able to store all this data, uh, and this 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 data is going to have to get stored somehow, right? Uh, presumably, and a solution like Filecoin that can offer uh, more of a you know you know, like a more, like there's more capacity. We can offer more capacity. We can offer, you know, different pricing models or whatever. Uh, a, a solution like this is basically going to need to exist in order for all of this, all this data to be stored somehow. Is that, that's, that's kind of what you're saying? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. I mean, again, the, the flight, the flight example is imagine you had a database of, you know, a million flights that you can just go in, 
and you, you pay a subscription to watch it, and you you want all these things pre rendered. You want to know that it you know it's got the flight like Microsoft Flight Simulator. Like what what a lot of these guys on YouTube will do is they'll actually run Microsoft Flight Simulator. They'll create the plane, and then they'll try and show you what the flight looked like. The guy kind of flew over this lake, and then he crashed here, and like you have the data. You just yeah you know there's a model that you create. You just go and make it, and it'll generate the videos. So generative AI, generative videos. Are going to be insane. Like, and if you, if you generating like three dimensional space, I think about how much data that is. So, yeah, I, I think that there are, there's almost an infinite number of use cases where AI is going to output a ton of data that needs to be stored, and I don't think you can store it in the traditional way. But do you, do you think that you know perhaps the the existing Web two data center model, like the the Google Clouds and Microsoft Azure's, could scale up to be able to uh, you know, store all that data some in some capacity, or is it is it just are we just talking about a capacity of data that's come that's going to come online that is just so massive that the current infrastructure just wouldn't be able to process, or there or there might not be the, the financial incentive to uh, to basically you know it might just be too expensive to store a lot of this data perhaps if there's limited space. I think it's a cost, and I think it's a, it's, it's it's time to scale as well. I mean, they can put up a data center. It takes months to put up a data center, or you know, even years in some cases. You've also got location issues. So you, you know, sometimes the data is too far around the world, and it's expensive to transport, especially large amounts of data and doing compute on that data. Um, you know, there's cost of bandwidth, traffic. Um, I, I have yet to be convinced that the future of the world is you know, lots of large data centers uh, storing data. I think it's distributed mesh network across the world, and you move data around and make it bring it close to the people who need it. Um, and you run compute where the data is um, instead of moving data around. In most cases, uh, we need we, we need it. I just don't think that you know. Can you imagine running compute on large large data sets like spatial data? So um, you know, some telescopic data for you want to you, you want to do compute on on an exabyte worth of space data, you want to move the exabyte to the server so that, the, that you run a computer on it locally. Like, it's just, it's crazy, right? So yeah, you have to se- send it through the post office or, you know, send it through the mail to... Yeah, it reminds me <laughs> of the days where it was cheaper for me to ship a CD to Texas from Cape Town than to upload it at one point. So... <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, now, now in, in Web3 and crypto, we're seeing all these, a lot of these kind of like AI token, you know, AI related projects popping up, right? So you have, you know, decentralized GPU networks and all these sorts of things. And um, I mean, I, I find this kind of an interesting next, maybe like level up on on top of maybe what what the, the, you know, the some of the ideas behind Filecoin is, but this idea of, of just off providing like decentralized compute services and whatnot. Um, are, are there any other maybe... You know, adjacent use cases that relate to like crypto and AI that you think there's there's a really compelling overlap or or maybe even interesting angle where 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 Filecoin might might play. Yeah, I mean, my, my the three companies and projects in the space that I focused on the most, I think, in the past couple of years is um, obviously Civic, which I've been over CEO for a while, and I'm, I'm chairman, executive chairman now, so I'm still involved, um, but not not day to day. But we're building very cool stuff there. Um, it's it's going to help. Identity is going to become very very important with AI because if you know people are already faking identities using AI, they're creating fake drivers licenses, fake people, fake everything. So I think that's an interesting. Um, maybe not in the, you know in the GPU side, but we have to use the on on cameras on devices to identify people. Then the next three are um, I was a seed investor in Solana, um, and so I led that round for Multicoin. We became one of the you know the biggest investors and supporters of Solana. And um, and then also I was early on in, in render as well, and render is distributed GPU compute. And 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 funny, like I've had I've had a lot of conversations with trying to get all three of them to work together in some way, right? So um, I think I introduced Anatoly and, and Juan uh, just over a year ago, actually, just start talking about working together. And so you know, I'm glad to see this worked out. Um, and, and and so um, and then with, with Jules, Jules is a total genius at uh, at rendering and compute. And so he works closely with NVIDIA and Apple, et cetera. And I think Render is going to be the, the, the most defining company of this year in terms of AI and, and AI compute because of all the general AI that's being required and the Render Network's ability to deliver compute anywhere in the world. Um, I think there are a million GPUs on the network right now. So uh, those are the three, I think, that are the, the winners in, in you know, some form of you know, deepen 
and 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 compute infrastructure. So yeah, you know, Falcon Render and Solana. Um, there's a whole slew of challenges. I mean, there's a, but you know, I've yet to see um, what I believe to be a, a you know a clear indicator that any one of those things is sustainable long term or, or going to break out. And when they do break out, that's great. But right now, it's very clear that Render, Render, Falcon, and Solana are the three. Uh, that, that will be the three biggest beneficiaries, um, at least in terms of usage. I mean, I, I'm not giving price predictions, but at least in terms of usage, um, using, you know, Solana is the best blockchain out there by, by far right now. Speed, cost. Falcon is the biggest network for storage, and it's it's actually reasonably decentralized. Um, and, then, and then Render is the best compute network because of what it offers no one else does and no one else can, because if you understand the dynamics of how it does calculations on... Uh, you know what Jules does, even with the Star Wars stuff they did recently, and it's on the Apple um, Vision Pro. That stuff is incredible. Like they're able to create like models <laughs> in real time of um, Star Trek, USS Enterprise, and stuff. It's it's, it's phenomenal. Um, but yeah, these are all crypto networks using crypto as a as a, as a foundation for building decentralized um, compute. And then. Um do you maybe think that this the that the emergence of generative AI over the last year, I think, or I think once you know ChatGPT went mainstream, everyone kind of had this like you know oh my gosh moment that like this like AI is a real thing. This is a real thing that 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 you know we have to sort of wrap, uh, grapple with. Um, but I think it, I feel like it it helped at least when I've been explaining Filecoin to people. I, I feel like once once we had this kind of generative AI rush of the last year. People seem to understand the value proposition that Filecoin brings a bit better, and just this idea that we have, like you know, the veracity and the verifiability of data, that where 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 previously maybe people didn't really think about it that much, where they're like, oh, like my data is stored in you know Google Cloud, like like sure, why why would I not trust Google Cloud to like take care of my data? But now now that we can see how easily data can be manipulable and 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 changed and whatnot, I think people kind of understand maybe a bit more. The value of having your data sort of cryptographically secured and sealed and verifiable. Uh, but have you thought at all about that that narrative? Is that does that does that ring true with you? Or have you noticed any anything like that? My my experience in this realm is that people don't care. Develop developers are the ones that should care. Um, your users are going to trust you to make the best decisions, and when you screw up, then that's when that's when you know that's when they're going to care. But until then, it's on you. So you need to make the best decisions and. I think you know in in peace times. I think it's not a big deal. You know, we don't have U.S. at war directly with another country where now we're cutting off people and services. But if if ever we have a situation where we go into a, a World War Three or some sort of you know um, massive territorial dispute across major Westernized countries, uh, then this becomes interesting because now you have country, c- companies able to countries able to take data about users from one country to another, steal data, shut them off, cut them off, apply sanctions. Russia got a taste of that already. Um, I think the Russians probably care where the data is being stored now because some services are no longer available to them and now they don't have access to data. So I think as we see that, if that grows uh, and increases over time, then you'll probably see more of a reason why this becomes important. But I always say that users don't care until they until a developer screws up. <laughs> That's a good way of thinking about it, actually. And I think I, I would definitely agree with that assessment. Um, well, k- kind of winding up the up here at the uh, the interview, uh, would love to get your thoughts on uh, just general advice you'd have for maybe builders in the Filecoin ecosystem right now. Um, you're obviously a serial entrepreneur, built a lot of companies. You've been you know kind of involved in Filecoin ecosystem since day one. Uh, but what advice would you have for folks who are are building here? I mean, my advice is just. Just do it. Like it's it's a very simple thing. Like make it a core part of your architecture. It's always harder to bring something in later than to start with it, right? So if you start with Filecoin, um, yes, it's going to be slower. Yes, you have to figure out how to do things that you would do otherwise differently on AWS. But it's a lot harder to switch from AWS later on to Filecoin. And so as long as you can get eighty percent of the features you need, and there's some roadmap that you know of that's going to get you what you need, or you can work with a team, or you know. Submit your own pull request. Who, who knows? Like you can figure out how to uh, work with it. It's better to start off from the beginning on the network than to try and change course later on. And um, you know, obviously, you know, the most important thing is finding product market fit um, for your product, and then you choosing who you use in the back end is kind of secondary to that. Um, you don't want to paint yourself in a corner. But I think that if you 
if, if decentralized storage is, is important to you philosophically for your company, um, I think doing it sooner rather than that is more important. And, and then find investors who align with it, right? Um, uh, you know, I think getting investment right now is it's a little easier, but it's still hard, I think, for most most founders trying to start projects. So doing the accelerators, working with the team, uh, the tacking on lab stuff is pretty cool. I don't know if they're still running that. Um, but, uh, you know, there's always investors out there, but, you know, we want good deals. Don't come with crazy valuations either. <laughs> <laughs> but we, you know, like especially early on, because the the risks are very high, the failure rates high. Even though everyone thinks they're going to be successful, we, what we see is that it, that's not the case. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, so just do it, right? Just, just, just dive in. Um, make a bet on the network. Just you know, if, even if it's got eighty percent of the features that you need, like just make the bet on. Hey, this is going to be operational and fully, fully operational, fully up. You know, sooner than later. Um, so Vinny, uh, really appreciate your time today. Thanks for joining us. Uh, it was really awesome hearing about your, your, just your kind of journey in file in the Filecoin ecosystem, uh, since day one and how can folks get in touch if they want to follow you or reach out? Uh, I'm, I'm easy to find on Twitter. Just hit me up on Twitter. Just, you know, tag me on something and, um, you know, uh, it's always better to get someone who knows me to make an introduction. So I don't give out my email address easily because I just get a lot of spam. Uh, and so yeah, anyone at Protocol Labs will point you to somebody who knows me. Uh, so you know, I also like the I like the founders jumping through a little bit of hope, hoops to get to me because it means that they, you know, it's not like um, every other investor out there. I mean, it, it's it, even even the best introductions I've had is from a referral. Like I mean, I met Anatoly because. One of his friends I knew because I invested in his friend's company, and I totally asked for an introduction to me. This is back in 2018 when Solana was getting started. One of the best introductions I've ever received. It came from a warm reference who knew me. So I, I, I like my, my hit rate on cold emails is extremely low. In fact, when I get a cold email, more often than not, if it looks like it's from a CRM system or some sort of uh, you know uh, you know mass outreach, I just block that person. So even if they then come back later on with an introduction from someone else, <laughs> they're blocked. So I, I'm pretty ag aggressive about that because I think the best founders uh, will work hard to find a mutual connection to get to uh, the investors that they want. And you know, and, 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 and if the style is just spam everyone, I'm, I'm, I'm just not the guy for that. I, I, I like the personal touch. Great, great. Well, thank you for that insight. And um, Vinny, really appreciate your time here today. And um, Thanks, everyone, for joining us for this conversation. Thanks, Aaron. Great to be here.